This is the Friday, October 10th, 2014 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now is Dan Huber. Dan, welcome back. Thank you very much. We've got a question here from Chad in Minnesota, and it's uh, rather a broad question, but probably a lot of producers are curious. What is your long-term perspective for the grain markets? As we enter this downward phase, a lot of producers are getting nervous. Where do you see us going long term? The, uh, I really think we're approaching what are going to be some very long-term lows, particularly in the corn and the wheat market. I think the, the $3 level, in essence, we're only 20 cents away from there on the spot corn right now. That $3 level probably will be, what, in essence, will be the bottom side of the corn market for the next 25 years. Not that we're going to stay here for 25 years, of course, but you know, if you look back on the uh, the history of corn uh, patterns, we'll tend to get in, tend to get in very large ranges. You know, through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, four dollar corn to two dollar corn. We, we traded back and forth. You could go back into the the prior 20 year period. It was a dollar to a, a 250. You know, back and forth. I think we're really moving into now a period where corn is probably going to trade in a range of three at the low side. I'm suspecting 550 to 6 at the upper side. Granted, we probably won't see that upper side for two to three years, but uh, historically, you, you, you tend to put in major lows about two years after a major record peak. That takes us out to 2014, so I think it's just going to be more of a basing period. Uh, we'll establish some new value. As the old saying goes, you know, lower prices should bring uh, new demand. And, mm -hmm. uh, the best cure for low prices, of course, is low prices. So it, uh, ideally, I think that just sets us up for kind of redeveloping that demand base as we move out into uh, 2015 and beyond. And so. do you see that same sort of story taking place in the soybean market? To a certain extent, yes. I think beans have got a little more hurdle ahead of them. You know, the uh, not only are we seeing this this what appears to be a phenomenal crop here this year. Uh, there's no guarantee that South America will produce a good crop, but they are increasing acreage again. Most of the privates now looking out into 2015 for the U.S. crop think we're going to see an increase in the U.S. acres again, so we could have a higher planted acreage for beans than we do for corn next year, which will be a, another record setter. So it's uh, beans, I think, have got a struggle ahead of us. In fact, uh, it, without there was nothing really stunningly as a surprise, or at least in a positive sense, on this report here this afternoon. Sure, carryout was a little bit less than the last report, but it's 450 million bushels. I mean, it's you know we we've got uh, more than double the amount of beans we to even be comfortable. And uh, you know, if we start talking about South America coming out with a good crop, China has been a great buyer to this point, mm -hmm. but we know how fickle they can become. It could be switching some of those sales to the south. And if they feel comfortable with the South American production, chances are most of their purchases will move south as well. So I, I think there's potential for at least a dollar uh, risk to the downside in the bean market yet. So, okay. Yeah. Well, and so now that leads us right to our next question. Jay in North Iowa is, uh, is sitting in a place a lot of producers are sitting today. He's asking, should I make grain sales? Uh, he's just filling his bins. Mm -hmm. A lot of unpriced corn. There's a lot of unpriced corn and beans out there. Sure, sure. Do you sell now or do you... Do you hold as much as you can and wait for that January rebound? You know, the uh, and part of it, Chris, is going to be based on the cash flows. I mean, uh, you know, everybody needs money at some time or another. Mm -hmm. So, uh, unfortunately, if you're really just sticking in the bin with the hope of a higher price, too often you're kind of forced to make a sale when you don't want to just because you have to You have to generate some cash. I In the, uh, the corn, is we discussed a little bit earlier, we've got great carry in the corn market. I think you take advantage of the carry. You sell the premium that's out in the deferreds. The bean market, you know, we have been, um, we've been more taking the stance that, you know, when you look at these yields, uh, you know, you, you've been given a, a blessing in the respect that is compensated pretty dramatically for a lot of the prices. And, and not that everybody's getting great yields, but, but on the same token, boy, uh, I, I think you just have to convert these to cash. If we see an opportunity later to come back with an option strategy or something, fine and dandy, but uh, don't, don't hold the risk of, uh, boy, I, I hope prices go higher because there's so many things stacked up against the beans right now. Just a lot of downside risk potential. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. All right. And now we've also got a couple of questions here. Phil in Ontario, Canada, and Gail in West Central Iowa are both curious about test weights. Mm -hmm. uh, the concern is Northern Corn Belt is going to have a lower <laughs> test weight. Uh, will this ultimately lower the USDA yield? Have we seen an impact with that? The uh, You know, I can speak from a uh, close to home on this one, really, because, and, and I've noticed all summer is, you know, I've traveled in about a five or six state area. And I've always, when I got back home, which is northern Illinois, have uh, no, felt that, you know, some of the roughest, and it wasn't rough looking, don't take me wrong, some of the roughest looking crops, though, were right in our neck of the woods. And uh, 
harvest, of course, slowly beginning, and that has been a real problem in our area. You know, in fact, the volume is there. I mean, they're seeing a lot of volume in the combine, a lot of volume in the truck. Test weight's 51, 52 pounds. So it, that doesn't make a disastrous yield. The yield is still average to a little above average, but not what it should have been. So far, um, that's one of the few areas I've heard that issue. Downstate, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal yields, great test weights, great quality. Uh, but we really haven't seen much harvest Wisconsin, Minnesota, the Dakotas yet. So if it's going to show up, it'll certainly show up in those uh, regions. If it is widespread, absolutely. You know, it's a, um, that, that could be the, the ultimate factor that you know, if the market's really geared up for 177 bushel, I mean, there's been people talking about 180 bushel national yield. If we don't see that, if, if, we, if we think it's going to be there, it doesn't materialize, that ultimately could be the spark that helps turn the market around as well. Could so, be the 51, 52 pound corn right, is, right. is what breaks that. Unfortunately, we probably won't really know that until January. Okay. So, <clears throat> one of those reasons, if you're holding corn, you know, maybe January would be a, a better time to. Now, as we take a look out at the, <clears throat> the broader markets, we saw a crazy week in Wall Street. Mm -hmm. We also saw a crazy week in crude oil. Sure. Talk to us a little bit about what's happening in crude oil as producers are you know, filling their gas tanks, filling their diesel. Oh, Where is this going certainly. longer term? Yeah. You know, in fact, on the way out here, I, I put less than $3 fuel in my, my vehicle for the first time, and I don't know how long. So it's, uh, you know, it really, just like so many commodities out there right now, we just have an excess amount of production around the world. I mean, we know in this country, with uh, through the fracking, we have really stepped up the production of oil. Um, Europe, uh, not Europe, I mean, Russia, of course, uh, a major producer over there. And, of course, they're in a situation they need to generate as much... Uh, revenue is possible to uh, finance the situation there. there. We've got, of course, a, a bit of a financial war going between the West and Russia at this point in time. So, uh, you know, they're doing what they can to, uh, to generate cash by pumping out all the crude they can. Uh, the, uh, the Middle East uh, continues to stay at, uh, you know, strong production levels. And you have a couple couple countries that are on the rebound right now that, you know, of course, have, have come out of some dire economic problems and uh, more situations need to generate cash. Saudi Arabia just re, or just opened a new uh, uh, refinery, I think one of the largest in the world. So, I mean, you've just got a, a glut of oil continuing to move onto the market and, and really doesn't seem to be a uh, anything in the way to stop it at this point in time. So, At what point should we be worried as crude prices continue to fall, assume mm -hmm. they do, at what point would the major producers, I'm thinking OPEC nations, mm -hmm. look to cut back production? You know, it's, uh, and again, for us, I mean, there's probably more of a, an impact on other, other places. Yes, Saudi, we do take quite a bit of crude oil from Saudi Arabia, but, you know, we're, we're less and less impacted by this all the time. I mean, it's, we're, we're not energy independent yet, but I think um, most of the people in the industry feel within another five years, we will be energy independent, uh, you know, particularly from, you know, some of those sources we don't necessarily want to have to deal right. with. Always so it's a, uh, well. so uh, yeah, they, uh, they, they could try to tweak it, but you know, even, even when OPEC, you know, gets together and, and tries to uh, limit supply, there's just, there's always that internal conflict. There's always people ready to, you know, for their own purposes, they need to have the money, uh, tend to uh, make it move under the table. So it's, uh, I, I don't think you have much control over it at this point. So. All right. Now, before we let you go, you mentioned uh, briefly during the program about mm -hmm. uh, the economies uh, slowing down around the world. There's the potential that we're seeing it in Europe. We're seeing them engage in sort of a quantitative easing program. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and consequently, we've seen the dollar rebound quite nicely. Oh, absolutely. Do you expect to see the dollar continue to climb? You know, the dollar did slip backwards a little bit this week. It, uh, in a general sense, yes, uh, but it, it, has, it has had a very substantial rally here over the last six to seven months, uh, reached some of the highest levels since the, I think, around 2010. You know, complete flip uh, you know, 180 degrees off of what's happened to the commodity sector, which, you know, and again, makes sense. I mean, there's that, there is that correlation there. I, I, I tend to think it's probably going to back away a little bit, but looking out further into 2015, no, the dollar looks like it's going to be in command for a while. So it's uh, Will it be a substantial anchor on commodities as we go forward? You know, I, um, interestingly enough, I was at a, a conference in Chicago this week and with a, uh, uh, a, a very interesting individual. In fact, he had just written a book I believe it's called the uh, the coming collapse of the currencies of the dollar. Uh, it would sound like a doom and gloomer, and he's not. I mean, he, that that was not his take. He he. Uh, in fact, th this was an individual who uh, who happened to be one of the participants in 1971 at Camp David when they took the dollar off the gold standard when Richard Nixon made that decision. So he's his. Uh, 
His He's expertise, his expertise yeah. is, uh, is much stronger than mine. And, uh, you, you know, he, he doesn't see a, a, a long-term positive picture for the dollar. But, you know, he's talking more five, six, seven years down the road okay. uh, when some of the, uh, the, some of the current ills will ultimately have caught up with us. So it was, uh, it was an interesting perspective on, uh, on what the future might hold. So, All right. Yeah. Well, Dan, thank you for taking the time to be with us this Absolutely. weekend. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for sending in your questions via Facebook and Twitter. Please continue to do so, and we will get expert analysis right to you. Thanks for watching, and have a great weekend.